And a good Sunday morning to everyone. Paul Senapiatis here with Strathclyde Engraving, getting ready to start another piece. Uh, just finished up a piece for a customer. That was the Black Sabbath piece shown in the last videos that I uploaded to YouTube. So we're going to begin to another piece today. Took a couple of days for myself. Goodness knows I needed it. A uh, little bit of tired going on. So that in addition to needing to get the lawn mowed, <laughs> weed eating, <laughs> garbage put by the road, I mean, on and on and on. So, I mean, you know, let's not forget the engraver has a life too. <laughs> All right, folks, what I'm doing this morning is preparing this gorgeous Mokume brass and copper Mokume tube for uh, work to begin engraving. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to get over the top of this and get a, a good uh, good cleaning on it. I'm using 91% uh, isopropyl rubbing alcohol uh, and this is primarily not to not to create a polish or anything on the tube this is more to remove any body oils or anything along those lines that might prevent the Damar varnish from adhering to the surface correctly uh, body oil will tend to if I'm not mistaken, it tends to spread that stuff out a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do something that we can do beforehand, a preparation, so that we can begin to do the work that we need to do. Now, uh, the, the stencil that I'm going to be using <clears throat> is right here. It's a, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous, not a little bit more complex, but uh, I know that this is going to have tremendous visual impact. So I'm going to give this just a second to dry, and then I'll be coming back with Damar varnish and a cotton swab to apply the stencil. Once again, uh, I use Grumbacher products. Uh, I'm using a Grumbacher uh, Damar varnish to prepare the surface for the stencil. So I figure that alcohol is probably dried by now. So I'm going to grab a cotton swab and uh, I'm going to dip it in my varnish, knock off any excess, and then over the entire surface area that I am going to be working on, I'm going to be applying a layer of this Damar varnish. Now I don't want this thick, thick. All I'm looking for is a thin layer. If you find that while you're doing this on your piece, if you have been watching my channel for any kind of uh, you know engraving how-tos, uh, you want a thin layer of Damar varnish. You do not want a thick layer, but you do want to ensure that you have complete coverage on your piece. And the best way to do that is you know just kind of go over it a couple of times with your uh, cotton swab that has been saturated with the Damar varnish. Now what we're going to do is we're going to allow this to dry for a few moments and normally it doesn't take all that long. What I'm trying to do is get this to a point to where the surface is tacky. Now while this is doing this I'm going to get my light down here just a little bit closer so that I can visualize exactly where uh, the center of this piece is going to be and how I am going to apply it. So that's kind of what I'm looking at now. I'm just going to make sure that my piece is nice and centered here, straight on my ball vise. Uh, I don't want uh, and I'm referring to the tube. I'm not referring to the, you know, the actual position of the ball of ice because the tube already has an outline engraved on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly check. This is starting to get, starting to get tacky. It needs just a few more minutes, I think, because you want it actually sticky to the touch. You want to be able to touch it, and it want to hold your finger. And we're kind of, we're very quickly getting to that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin the process of applying the stencil. So I know where my center is and I'm going to very carefully lay this piece down on top of here. And 
and then very carefully wrap it around. You guys have seen me do this before. All right, now I'm going to grab my burnishing tool, which is this piece right here. It's made from an antler tine off of a white-tailed deer. Uh, I have a, a good bit of this stuff laying around as uh, flint nabbing is flint napping, not nabbing. Flint napping is a hobby of mine, and you use these antler tines to actually. Uh, do your napping. So what I've done is I've created a curved surface on the back of it with a file and my purpose in that is to leave me a rounded smooth surface with which to burnish this design down and onto the piece that I'm working on. Now for those of you who've never seen me do this before uh, in a previous video, I explained uh, how to print this design out, or, or print a design out. I'm, uh, I'll, let me go over that again with you while I'm burnishing this down. I'm actually printing the design out on kitchen parchment paper. You can buy this at Walmart. Uh, you can buy it at supermarkets. Any place that sells like you know kitchen or cooking supplies you should be able to go there and find a roll of kitchen parchment paper. Um, I use parchment paper when I bake, break, break, bake bread here at my home and parchment paper is one of those wonderful things that it seems like nothing will stick to. It's like the Teflon of paper I guess you could say, if it is even paper. But by using a laser jet printer with your print options set to the highest print density and your the print uh, how would I describe that the you know the accuracy of the print mine is I have a 600 DPI and a 1200 DPI setting I use the 1200 DPI setting this way I ensure that I get a very, very good, you know, a good amount of ink transferred onto the surface of the piece, which is exactly what I want. And then the Damar varnish does the rest for me. When it gets tacky, it pulls that ink straight off the piece and onto the tube or surface that I will be working on. Doing it on a tube does take a little bit of practice. It's not something that I would say is easy to do. It's taken me a while to perfect this technique and I cannot claim, uh, I can't claim responsibility for this technique. This was shown to me by a fellow engraver who saw that I was struggling with uh, how to, you know, get a, an effective stencil transfer. Because let's face it, Unless you're drawing freehand onto the surface of a piece, which takes years of practice and years of experience to do, a transfer is the easiest way to get things done. The more effective your stencil transfer is, the better your lines will be as far as seeing where, why, and when you need to cut. Now, folks, I think I've just about got this. I'm looking at it. And the one thing that I look for when I do this, just to let you know, is when you look at the back of the paper, I mean, you're turning it print side down, ink side down onto the work surface. When you, when you begin to burnish this, the lines are very, very noticeably black as you look through the parchment paper. But when you burnish it down, after that Damar varnish has gotten tacky, what you'll see is those lines kind of go to a light gray. You can tell when they've come off the surface of the Damar, uh, or, or, of the parchment paper onto the Damar varnish that is tacky, and it'll hold it in place. Now I do one extra step in this process, which makes things a little bit easier for me and that is to spray it with a fixative. So I believe we've got this burnished down. So what I'm going to do is very slowly and very carefully lift this away 
from the surface of the of the piece. Now, if I lift it up to a point where I see these three little dots right here, that tells me that the stencil did not come off in those spots. So what I'm going to do is put the piece back down and over those areas where I saw that the stencil did not drop, did not transfer, I am going to go back over it, burnish it very carefully, and ensure, see there's another one, right up there at the top, trying to be a pain. As long as you've got all your major lines there, it, you know, I'm not saying that you have to go back every time, this, that, and the other, but it does make a huge difference if you can do this. So it looks like we got a killer transfer. It is perfectly centered. I am very, very happy with this. All right. So this now, as you can see, these areas, see where the, where the ink has remained? That's where the Damar varnish was not. In other words, I didn't, I didn't apply Damar varnish in the area that this covered. Now you can see a little bit of it pulled off there, but in these corners, which are actually outside of the design area, I don't really have to worry about it. But that is how you do a really good transfer. And as you can see, my lines are bright, they're bold, they're clear, they're very distinctive. It makes a huge difference when you go to engrave. So what I'm going to do is use a fixative now, and I'm going to roll this back towards me so that I can bring that can of fixative up here so that you guys can see it. Once again, I use Grumbacher products. Uh, I like the results that I get with them. So this is what I'm going to be using. And forgive me for turning this sideways because I, I can't set it straight up and down. But uh, this is a Grumbacher fixative. This is a final fixative that can be used for pastels, charcoal, pencil drawings, that sort of stuff. But the nice thing about this, over the surface of this tube, it will fix in place this piece that you just saw me transfer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this a few moments to dry. Uh, I want to make 100% sure that it is dry. I don't want to be able to remove, see like I did right there on the outside of the design area, I can just put my finger down and, and a line comes off. In fact, there's that line right there. This is what we want to try to avoid and this is why I spray a fixative. So I'm going to give this a few minutes to dry. Once it's dry, I'm going to hit it with my fixative and we will come back and begin to start engraving. So we're going to take a little bit of a break and I'll be back in a few moments. All right, folks, back from the drying break and the fixative break that we took, I have just sprayed this with fixative probably about two to three minutes ago, which is enough time for the fixative to dry. So I can take my finger and actually run it across the surface of the piece and I don't get any of the ink off, which is a very, very important step. Without the fixative, the problem is as you run your fingers across the surface of the piece that you're engraving, which is something that's going to happen as you're bracing your graver while you're cutting metal, some of the design lines could disappear. And that's really not something that you want to happen during that process. So what we're going to do is I am going to begin to rearrange a few things here. Uh, sorry about the piece going dark, but uh, the light's going to get turned back on now as I drop this under my scope. And I am going to uh, get my scope positioned uh, zoom it out so that I can see and begin to take a look. Now, as I look at this, you guys are looking at this, you see solid black lines. What I am seeing is almost like a, um, I guess you could say almost like a dot matrix print of, of the stuff, uh, or of the stuff, <laughs> of the design that's actually on the piece. When I zoom in uh, and focus, uh, tiny, it, it actually looks like the, the lines were formed by stippling. Uh, which means that the design itself that I took it from was not as clear as it could have been. Oh, it sounds like my neighbor's finally mowing their lawn. Glory be. All right, so we're going to zoom this back out and we're going to begin the engraving process. Now, as I've explained before, I tend to work from the right side of the piece as I'm looking at it to the left side. This is an old habit. Uh, I think that it's a good habit simply because of the fact that that uh, it is very, very easy, uh, you know, in, at least the way I was doing it before, it was really easy to like wipe the design away and I really don't want to do that. So we have the compressor on, uh, I'm going to fire up my graver mock and I'm going to select a 
graver to work with. Most likely I will be working with a 120 degree graver this morning. That's a 105. And lo and behold, this should be my 120 right here. All right, so let's get this situated. And what I'm going to do before I start is I'm going to actually put a go and grab a, a quick sharpening on this. I need to make sure that my lines are straight. I want to ensure that my graver geometry is correct, face, heels, and then my facets that I cut so that I can actually see what I'm engraving. It makes it a little bit easier for me. So give me a moment. I'll be right back and we're going to get started on this engraving. With my graver nicely sharpened and polished and set correctly, I'm going to start be to start to cut lines, start the process of the uh, of engraving in earnest. Now, as an engraver at this point, I have a decision. I kind of either cut outside these lines or cut to the inside of them. And as I said, it looks like in terms of the lines that are actually drawn, it looks like they're stippled. So what I'm going to do is be going to the inside of these lines. Uh, to achieve the effect that I want to achieve. bring my strokes per minute down a little bit because I'm not I wasn't really happy with the way that that line felt in hand so One of the things that always comes to the forefront of my mind when I am uh, when I'm cutting these lines, the the interface. between the copper and the brass is something that's noticeable. I can pick up on it immediately. thing back towards me a little bit. There we go. Now I'll be able to spin this thing without any problem. All right, let me grab another little quick focus on it and we will continue. One of the things that I notice is that there's a noticeable difference in feel. As I cut these lines, you, there's a difference in feel between copper and the brass. 
So that's something that I try to constantly be aware of as I am engraving because it will actually change your line up on you if you're not careful. Once again, give myself a focus and get back to it. Now I'm going to be cutting into a line here, creating an intersection. And at that point you want to go kind of slow. The reason being easily done. Got a straight line that comes out of the edge and borders straight into that so I'm going to go ahead and make that cut. thin line that starts back here just barely off the edge. Now granted this line that I'm cutting right now won't actually be seen on the piece itself. The vaping device or mod that this is going into. When it comes to this type of design, the one thing that a lot of people don't fully don't fully understand. Hey, I'm just gonna I'm gonna send you a tube and you can engrave it. Okay, I can do that. How big is the open area on the device that we're talking about? Unless I have a clear picture of how big that area is, don't expect it to be right. I've already run into that problem once. And uh, it created some issues. But I took action to solve those issues so that they would never happen again. And they have not, thankfully, reared their head again. All right, so let's see where we're at. Let's see what I'm going to need to do. All right, I think what I'm going to do is kind of start just exactly where I'm at and begin to go up and take a look at some of the other line areas that are going to need to be cut. Anything that's like immediately available to me, that's exactly what I'm going to hit first. So. I'm trying to do is gauge something that I'm looking at here.
move this down a little bit more, get it more centered, perfect. Now I can continue. Refocus and start moving. tell every time I hit one of those copper brass intersections my graver wants to try to dive in deeper and that's just the nature of this metal Because you're actually switching, you know, brass is soft, copper is soft. But copper is an alloyed metal, or brass is an alloyed metal, copper is a pure metal. So you run into this issue where you go from soft to hard, soft. And when you're switching back and forth between those metal interfaces, which is something you're going to end up dealing with on a Mokumai tube, see like right here, your graver just wants to play this little game of I'm going to take a dive in this metal and you're like no you're not and you end up sometimes fighting with it a little bit the big thing is When I'm cutting these lines, I'm leaning out with my graver just a tad. And there's a reason behind it. Now when you're when you're doing scroll work, that would be referred to as a flared cut, and it's done for a visual impact. In this piece, the reason that I'm doing it is because I can see the inside wall of the line that I'm cutting much more clearly. And for me that's very important. As long as that inside line's clean, that's all I'm worried about. Because areas like this, 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 this entire area here, uh, an area back here, all of that's gonna that's an area that metal is going to be removed. So 
ensuring that the line towards the inside is clean is what's important. Tell you what, of all the Moku pieces that I have done, the metal in this one is cutting a whole lot differently from other metals that I have cut that have been Moku. Are there other tubes that I've cut that have been Moku? And that kind of kind of makes me wonder a little bit. Connect these lines here. Super. And I want to move that down a little bit so that I can access that one corner.
Excellent. All right, let's come up a little bit farther up, making sure all of our intersections have been cut here, which it appears that they have been. That's why I'm kind of why I'm leaning the piece over. I want to make sure. And let's get started on our next long line. Roll this back up towards the top a little bit. Some of these areas are easy to hit, some of them are not. A lot of it's dependent on where the piece is at, how it's laying. Quick focus. Back at the intersection here. workable that's metal that's going to be removed so I'm not going to lose any sleep over it all right and we'll just continue to move on through the rest of the day but rather than take you guys through the rest of the day what I'm going to do is sign off right here and let you guys go on to have head and have some fun of your own today instead of being glued to the TV or to your device watching this process unfold. Folks, Paul Senapiat is here saying thank you very much for watching my YouTube channel. Thank you for uh, all of your support of uh, Strathclyde Engraving. I do appreciate it very much. Words cannot express how much I appreciate each and every one of you. Please, uh, if you like what you've seen, subscribe to my channel. Love to have you. This way you'll receive notifications of every new video that goes up. And if you see one that you like in particular or you like them all, makes no difference, just drop me a like and let me know that you've been by. Make a comment. I uh, love hearing from you guys on each and every piece that I do. So once again, Paul Sinabiata saying thank you. Signing off, Strathclyde Engraving. Have a wonderful day.